Hello, everybody. I see people coming on in and I am so thrilled to welcome you to today's traffic online meetup. Thank you so very, very much. Um, this went over to you, Ricardo. Thank you so very, very much for joining us. And um, I personally am super excited for today's webinar or online meetup. It is with CERN who does amazing, huge experiments with stuff um, about our great, grandiose, beautiful universe, which I'm totally into. Um, and so we get to learn how they're using traffic to manage all this data, what their stack is, and we get to hang out with Ricardo Rocha, who is a um, really dope guy. And so uh, to get started, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I'm Patricia Dugan, and uh, I am um, the head of community for traffic, proudly. I represent our huge community, huge and growing community. And um, basically, uh, I put together this program to showcase the ways that companies are using traffic to solve interesting technical challenges. And the things I'd like you to know about are threefold. One is we just came out with Traffic Pilot, which is a SaaS um, control platform that can manage all of your instances uh, for you and give you security alerts. So if you're not familiar with that, you should definitely check it out. And uh, I also designed the Traffic Ambassador Program, which is a group of people who are very radical and um, they're contributors of code, content, and community. And if you are a traffic ambassador, you earn uh, rewards, promotions of your efforts, and also you're invited to a private traffic Discord server by which we do very cool stuff and you get uh, direct access to many cool things. So if you're interested in participating, please drop me a line. And then the last thing that I'd like to say is, if any of you have amazing use cases around traffic, I would love to learn more about how you're using traffic and see if there's collaborative things we could do together with you and your company if you would be interested. So you can find me on Twitter at Patricia underscore Dugan. You can find traffic at traffic. And um, today what we're going to do is listen to a Ricardo uh, talk about his work at CERN and he's going to show us some beautiful demos and, and we're going to be blown away by just the scope of how big their operations are. Um, and then as far as Q&A, please drop your questions in the chat box or the Q&A module. We'll answer them at the end. And if we don't get to them, we will follow up with the answers to those in a gist and I will be sending you the recording of this meetup via email. So I look forward to getting to know you. Please uh, email me if you need anything at patricia at contain.us, contain us. And um, now I will say thank you again for joining us and hand it over to Ricardo and uh, enjoy your time today with us. Thanks again for joining us. Cool. So I hope you can hear me. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll share my screen quickly. Can you see my screen, hopefully? Yep. For some reason, I can't. It's black right now, though. Yeah. For some, it's loading. Okay. Okay. Do do Interesting. I tried to bring it. We we're just talking about uh, something not working quite as expected. I forgot to pray to the demo gods. Yeah, actually, uh, let me see here. Okay, I can probably share the slides in another way. If you can't share, we you can always, if you need to go out and come back in or, or whatnot. Yeah. Thanks for your patience, everyone. <laughs> the other option is I just share like uh, not full screen and that will probably also do it. Okay. 
Do what you gotta do, we'll be here. You can see this, right? Yep. Yeah, so let me see if I can do this in a way that works. Because for some reason, okay. Is this good enough if I leave it like this? Uh, I'm okay with that if, if everyone else is, unless you want to try again. Um, anyone who is not in favor of this holler, but otherwise, let's tr let's just do it. If you can do it, we could do it like this. Okay. I mean, as far as recording goes. It's okay? Yeah, I think so. Just try once more. It's not going to work. Okay, I'll do Thanks, it like Thanks, Michael. This. Welcome, Michael, everyone. Okay. So, I'll start right here. here. Okay. Cool. Okay, I'll I'll do it like this then. Um, so I have hi everyone. Um, my name is Ricardo. I'm, I work at CERN in the CERN Cloud team. I'll start with just by introducing myself quickly. Um, I'm a computing engineer in the CERN Cloud team. Uh, I focus mostly on uh, containers, uh, Kubernetes, networking aspects of our clouds. Um, as well as uh, things uh, around accelerators. So that means uh, GPUs um, and other types of accelerators. Uh, we started doing quite a bit of machine learning. So I also work in that area to support our users. Um, previously, I worked in the WLCG, which is the worldwide LHC computing grid. The LHC is the Large Hadron Collider, which is the largest experiment we have today. And uh, the computing grid is a large network of sites uh, that we've built over the years. I'll talk a bit about that as well. Um, I leave you my contacts here. So feel free to, um, to um, reach out if you have questions after. Um, or yeah, we'll, we'll cover quite a bit today, hopefully. But um, we can then uh, go follow up after as well. So I'll start by introducing a bit CERN and what we do. Uh, and then describe a bit uh, our infrastructure and how it has evolved with time. And then I'll jump into the, the containers and traffic uh, um, topic of today. So, so uh, One small second. Uh, yeah. There are at least, there are two people saying they can only see black. Um, can you see though? Or? Can, yeah, I can see it. And I think maybe also demographically, Okay, we many people can see it too. So it's a I would go out and come back in and now I'm going to stay out and let Ricardo rock and roll, but should I get I out? And okay. Back? Yeah, I think we're good. Uh, do you want me to get out or or just share it? No, not not you. People who can't see it should probably go okay. out and come back in. Okay, fair enough. So hopefully this is all good. Okay, so I was Introducing CERN. So CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. We are based in um, uh, Geneva in Switzerland, um, founded in 1954. And our main uh, purpose is to do uh, fundamental science. And what that means is uh, trying to answer like uh, big questions about uh, the, the universe, uh, which is what is 96% of the universe made of? Uh, what is dark manager, matter and dark energy? We don't quite understand completely uh, uh, a lot of what is it made of. Uh, what was the state of matter just after the Big Bang, a state uh, we call quark gluon plasma? Um, and why don't we see any antimatter? So theory is that we should have uh, the same amount of matter and antimatter, but actually um, we only see matter, so we try to do some research in that area as well. To answer these questions, we build uh, very large experiments, uh, uh, scientific experiments. The largest one today is the Large Hadron Collider. So in this map, you can see um, 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 the drawing of the particle accelerator, the LHC. It's 100 meters underground. Uh, it's 27 kilometers in uh, circumference. Um, and in this accelerator, we inject two beams of protons, one clockwise, one anti-clockwise. And at some specific points, we make them collide. And we build this very, very large experiments. Uh, um, and you can see the names here. The four main ones are Alice, CMS, LHCB, and Atlas. Uh, we we make these protons circulate to very very close to the speed of light, and we make them increase in in energy, and then we make them collide at these specific points. Uh, to have an idea of the size, you can see on the bottom right the Geneva Airport, the runway. So it's pretty large. And uh, one thing that is also quite interesting is that uh, 
Um, this is in the border between France and Switzerland. So actually, uh, depending where you are on the site, you might be changing country uh, as you uh, move along. So if we would go to the tunnel, so actually uh, we are currently under maintenance for upgrades and it would be a great way, a great time to come and visit because you could go down and visit uh, the experiments, but actually with the current situation, uh, this is not possible, but um, we are doing upgrades. But if you go to the tunnel, it looks something like this. You can see uh, the particle accelerator. These are superconducting magnets. Um, this is where we, we um, inject our beams and one, Thing that we often say is that uh, CERN is the coolest place in the universe and the, the, the reason for that is that um, um, to have this magnets being superconducting uh, we, we lower the temperature to very close to absolute zero uh, to I think it's 1.7 Kelvin um, and we have a lot of uh, cryogenic systems to, to achieve that. Um, then when we uh, make these beams collide uh, proton beams collide. We have these massive experiments. So these are also 100 meters in the ground. This is the compact muon solenoid CMS, which is not very compact. Uh, the cavern is like 40 by 40 meters. The detector itself is uh, uh, 14 tons, and you can see for scale um, a couple of uh, uh, human uh, like in the picture you can see the bodies. So it's, it's pretty massive and how this works is uh, these uh, detectors act like a giant uh, um, camera. Uh, it's not an actual camera making pictures but it, it's pretty much uh, acts like one and it takes 40 million pictures per second. And basically what we try is to, to see what resulted from the different collisions that are happening and it's billions per second. And then um, from here, uh, we the, this this data it has to be stored and collected. So this is an example of a collision as we reconstruct them. But to to actually get to this where we reconstruct the collisions and we try to see what happened, we need to record uh, a lot of data and analyze. And this analysis gives uh, something that for physicists is quite spectacular, but for the rest of the world is a lot less, which is a plot. Um, so it's not as uh, grandiose as uh, other domains of science, the displays, but uh, this, for example, is the CMS uh, plot that uh, showed, um, proved the existence of the Higgs boson back in 2012, and that led to the Nobel Prize in 2013. We can see here that uh, the blue part is uh, the simulation data or the known physics that we know uh, already uh, um, pretty much everything about, and then you have the black box dots which uh, are the actual data that we saw in the collisions and then you see the red bump which is the uh, predictive physics for, for the existence of the Higgs boson and you can see that when the data matches the, the, um, the prediction then with, with uh, enough data we can, can claim a discovery. So this is what we all work for uh, pretty much. We have other experiments also on site apart from the Large Hadron Collider. So one of them is the antimatter factory, uh, which is very close to the building where I work, uh, where we basically create antimatter when we try to see, um, uh, to understand better its behavior and try to understand why we don't see it uh, um, in the universe. And then we have an, also an, uh, an experiment, AMS, that is um, installed in the International Space Station uh, and does other kinds of uh, of uh, scientific experiments uh, really, um, using cosmic rays as well. Um, because of all the people we have on site working and the requirements we have to exchange information, um, CERN also develops quite a bit of uh, technology around IT. Uh, one of the most important ones was back in 89 when Tim Berners-Lee uh, created uh, what would be the World Wide Web. Um, and the goal was to have a way to, for physicists to easily share information between them um, and a standard way to access uh, this information as well. This is the, the paper from the initial proposal. And then in 91, CERN uh, decided that this was a technology that uh, would be useful for a lot more people and they made it public domain and uh, it grew quite a bit, of course. Uh, so to analyze this data, uh, one thing I mentioned when we saw this uh, detector uh, where we, detectors where we do all these collisions, actually the amount of data we generate is uh, something like one petabyte a second. This is of course not something that we can process. 
Uh, so I can show you this again. So out of these detectors, uh, we have like a small pit that will do the first step uh, filtering of this data and it will put the data down from one petabyte a second to something like 10 gigabytes a second. And these 10 gigabytes a second are something that we can store and analyze, uh, but we still need quite a bit of resources to do that. So we generate something like 70 petabytes of new data every year and we don't uh, delete any data. So we are close to half an exabyte uh, these days. Uh, we run a private uh, cloud on-premises, uh, which is based on uh, OpenStack. Um, and here you can see that it's quite large. We have like users uh, above 3,500 uh, unique users, lots of projects defined, more than 30,000 VMs and uh, close to 10,000 hypervisors. This is just for the compute and, and the cloud. Then we have a lot more uh, servers that are um, dedicated for storage. One relevant uh, number here is this Magnum clusters, which are actually the um, Kubernetes or the container clusters that we use, uh, which are quite relevant to this talk. Um, I, I will mention more, but they, they, they've been growing quite a bit in popularity, uh, all this containerized infrastructure. So this is not enough. So we have something like 300,000 cores. We saw here in this number, uh, close to 300,000 cores on, in this private cloud, but uh, we need more. So well, in the last 20 years, we developed this great, great um, um, infrastructure. Um, if you were around this area, uh, in this domain 20 years ago, you probably heard about grid computing. So we have um, more than 200 sites around the world that participate and collaborate with us uh, to, to help us analyze and process all this data. So we basically double our capacity thanks to this. If you look at it at any moment, you will see something like half a million jobs being run. Um, and we developed all this uh, um, infrastructure that is connected with uh, uh, dedicated links and um, has a bunch of uh, orchestration to decide uh, where to send these jobs around. And uh, I'll just finish this overview of CERN uh, computing. Uh, this is quite uh, um, interesting, I think, um, to see the evolution of computing at CERN. Uh, in the picture on the left, you can see how our data center looked in the 70s. So it's a pretty old building. Uh, you can see some Cray mainframes on the back. Uh, then around 2007, I was already at CERN. Uh, we decided to start doing rack-based uh, deployments, and but we actually used commodity hardware, like the stuff you get from the shops. And you can see the, these boxes that were not the most um, um, like efficient power and cooling efficient uh, way of uh, um, having a data center. So they actually didn't last very long. One interesting thing you see here on the right picture is also these silos for our tape robots. So one, one interesting part of our um, infrastructure is that we still rely on tape. So all the data is written to tape. Um, and we use it uh, mostly as backup. Um, but uh, we, we have very good experience with tapes. We have some tapes uh, that are 30 years old um, that still work quite well. And it's a very cheap way to, to have long-term storage as well. So we have a lot of storage in disks, uh, but uh, we also have uh, quite a bit of tape. And then of course, this is the, how it looks today. So it's a much more uh, uh, recent way of uh, structuring a data center with a bunch of racks and uh, cooling aisles and all these uh, normal things. You can see though that the building is quite big still, so it's not the easiest one to, to manage the cooling, but, uh, but it's a quite modern data center um, in, the, in the way we deploy things. And it's fully automated uh, using OpenStack and other tooling. Uh, so one curious machine that we have in our museum now, it's uh, this uh, next computer from, that was what uh, Tim Berners-Lee used to, to create the World Wide Web. Um, and uh, you, if you come and visit us, you can see it. Uh, the interesting thing is that it also had the sticker that says this machine is a server, do not power down. At the time, it was one of the two machines running the World Wide Web. So it happened a couple of times that someone in the office would power this down. And uh, so he wanted to make this clear that this should not happen again. 
If we look at the evolution, so I talked a bit of how our data center evolved. It's also interesting to see how uh, our computing evolved as well with it. Um, so if we look at what we used to have with the pure physical infrastructure, uh, provisioning was kind of problematic. Um, it could take days or weeks to get a new machine. You will have to open a ticket, wait that uh, if the machine is around, it's set up, or maybe it has to, to be bought as well. Uh, so this was kind of, uh, um, could, could take quite, a, quite some time. Any kind of maintenance was uh, typically highly intrusive. Um, this idea of having multiple replicas was okay, but actually the downtimes uh, could be quite important uh, because they were basically shutting down. Physical machines where a large fraction of your applications were running. Uh, deployments and updates, we were already using uh, automation tools, configuration management tools uh, like Puppet or I don't know, uh, in, in, in the house we use Puppet, but it could be Chef or Ansible. So it means that it can take minutes or a couple of hours for everything to be set up. Uh, the utilization um, uh, was quite poor uh, because uh, very often we had to isolate the applications, which meant uh, that even applications that do not require a lot of uh, resources would be dedicated in a physical machine. So uh, virtualization and especially this API-based uh, way of interacting with, uh, with computing resources uh, was really a, a breakthrough at the time. Uh, this meant that provisioning of uh, new instances like virtual machines uh, uh, now could take only minutes. Um, the maintenance, uh, because we have in a lot of our capacity the ability to do live migration, this could be a lot less intrusive uh, before operate, uh, um, doing maintenance on, on a node. We could just live migrate the instances. Uh, deployment and update is pretty much the same as uh, for the physical machines and utilization uh, increased a lot, not only because you can have uh, multiple vir virtual machines in the, in the same physical box, but because you can overcommit the resources and, um, and uh, like pack uh, applications that do not need a lot of resources. And then containers, which is uh, the reason why we are here as well. Um, in this case, provisioning is, is quite a bit quicker. It can take seconds, especially if you're just uh, scaling out uh, an application. Even new deployments just take a couple of seconds. Maintenance is definitely less intrusive. And here, the main reason is because uh, if you use an orchestrator for containers, you're expressing a lot more about your application than what you would traditionally do with a virtual machine. You will tell us and, and the orchestrator a lot more about uh, what kind of uh, um, things your, your application can, can deal with in terms of moving it around. Um, so we can automate a lot more in these in this cases. Uh, deployment and update is uh, uh, literally seconds uh, to, to, to do upgrades on, on our applications. And utilization, I put here that it's very good because there's an improvement uh, by not having uh, this kernel layer. And the improvement is both on the compute side because, uh, for example, for our batch systems, we saw that by using virtualization, even after a lot of, optimize, uh, of uh, work on optimizing the configurations, we still lose two or uh, almost 3% of the, the compute power. And if you have a large infrastructure like ours, uh, actually 2% can be something that you would be very happy to get back. Uh, and also because we don't have this extra kernel, uh, we also get a lot of memory back, not only compute. So that's, uh, that's why I mentioned here that containers actually have, uh, um, there's a motivation also in this area. So the three key aspects that we see in containerized infrastructure, the first one is uh, simplification because you know more about the application. Traditionally applications will also have very good integration with the um, tools for monitoring. If you're using something like Prometheus, the life cycle is, is uh, integrated into most of these orchestrators. Uh, the alarming is also um, common that it comes in the pack. Then the simplified deployment. So we have this simplified, uh, this uniform API that is uh, Kubernetes these days, uh, which means that uh, we can really focus on one way of uh, handling most of our workloads. Replication is also part of the definition of these deployments. Load balancing is also part of it. So all the fact that uh, the applications come with all these definitions already integrated in one standard and uniform API helps us a lot in simplifying our, our operations. And then uh, one thing that happens at CERN is that uh, we have 
80% um, of our capacity is what we use for batch, which is uh, basically like the main processing of the data that is coming. Uh, and then the rest of the capacity is for analysis and user analysis and other types of workloads. But we have spikes. Uh, if there's an international, big international physics conference, it's very common that the weeks before people are like uh, jumping on their analysis to finish their papers. And also every couple of months or a couple of years, people do reprocessing of old data to try to change the calibration of the um, detectors as well and see if the, if the results change. Uh, so if we have these campaigns, we also need extra capacity. So the fact that we have this uniform of API, it means that we have the capacity to go look for resources elsewhere and try to um, just expand our infrastructure. And this is much simpler when you have something like uh, the Kubernetes API um, available in, in these other uh, infrastructures um, so that we can burst more easily our, our, our capacity. So I'll, I'll just mention a couple of use cases that we have been using for containers. Um, so the first one is, is really cool. So this is uh, the picture on the top left is the Atlas detector, which is uh, one of the two big ones with CMS. As I mentioned, it generates something like one petabyte of, of uh, per second uh, of data. Um, typically this filter is uh, split in what is done purely in hardware which is the first uh, filtering and then uh, the second filter is based on software with um, a, um, a farm that is very close to, to the detector so we i mentioned we do something like uh, 40 million interactions per second which is what i mentioned uh, as pictures uh, there are 3000 uh, physical nodes and 30000 applications running in this cluster so it's a, it's a very cool use case for something like uh, running containers and kubernetes so we've been doing studies um, with them to, to, to try to, to see if uh, a containerized infrastructure could help with managing the, their farm, uh, especially because a lot of what was doing, being, do, being done by hardware is now moving to, to software in some areas as well because of uh, the advent of uh, GPUs and other accelerators. Uh, so what we've been trying to do is a study to see if in the next future runs for, for our uh, experiments, if we can change this infrastructure and improve uh, the setup. Uh, what happens with this experiment is that once you decide what is gonna run uh, during the, the period of this run, which can take like one year and a half, two years, you don't touch it. So we make a decision and we, if it works, we keep that setup um, during that period. So we've been doing this uh, for a couple of years already. We started with uh, Kubernetes 1.5. We are actually redoing the, the study now uh, to see, um, and the, the results are, are quite promising. Another cool use case uh, that I think is, is quite, um, um, in, in, it's coming up in other uh, members of the community uh, around Kubernetes is um, that we have all these sites collaborating with us and we need to distribute the containers. Um, to, to decide. So we, we, with time we develop, uh, we deploy the system that we call CERN VMFS, where we would push the experiment software to all these sites in this hierarchy, uh, where we first do a release of the software, push it at CERN, and then there's this kind of cache layers uh, to act like squid caches all around the world. And we only pull what, what is actually needed for, for the local site. This is a quite efficient, quite, uh, nice and efficient way of, of distributing our software. Now, as applications move to containers, this uh, started posing a problem because uh, you, like traditionally Docker will just pull the image and then launch the container. So we started looking at this. We first developed a component that was a graph driver that would basically, it's called what uh, was called, um, this was done by the CVMFS team and it was called a, a thin layer which basically instead of pulling the full image, you just pull this thin uh, layer that tells you where to find the actual image. And, uh, and then you do kind of a fuse mount uh, of a remote file system. And you just accept that the full uh, image is available in this mount. And as the container itself will require files, it will start pulling them uh, from the CVMFS file system. So we did this as a graph driver for Docker and their support now in container D uh, through this remote snapshot. And so I'm, I put the link here. It's a quite interesting work. Uh, 
uh, there's an, um, a plugin for what's called STARGZ, um, which is Seekable TARGZ as an alternative for Docker images. Uh, but uh, we, we, the team of CVMFS has been developing also a remote snapshot for our system. Uh, the results are brutal. We have very bad users that uh, have images of like 10, 15, 18 gigabytes. This can take uh, like several minutes and bring down our registries if you have a large enough cluster. Uh, with this, uh, with this um, driver, what we've seen is that the time to start a container is pretty much flat at five seconds, five, six seconds. And then you, you only pull, the jobs actually only pull like 6% of the data. So we actually gain a lot in also in network and bandwidth. And I mentioned machine learning. So that's also uh, uh, something that we've been investing a lot in, um, in, um, in our containerized infrastructure. So we are um, pretty heavy users of uh, uh, GPUs these days with Kubernetes. We are expanding our uh, GPU availability on-premises as well. Um, and uh, we do, here the example I have is this deep learning for fast simulation. So we need a lot of simulation data. I mentioned that we generate a, a lot of real data from the detectors, but actually we have a lot more simulation data than that. And generating this data is very expensive, um, compute intensive. So we've been exploring uh, um, machine learning to, to help with that as well. And then I mentioned the grid. So one very cool thing is that to run a grid site, you, you need a, a compute endpoint, you need a storage endpoint, you need the monitoring endpoint. So we started realizing that actually Kubernetes offers most of what we need in these grid sites, in this uh, large distributed system we have. So um, this is the example of one of the experiments that started trying um, running a grid site just as a Kubernetes endpoint. Um, and these are the results. So actually we already have production sites running which uh, behind only have a Kubernetes endpoint, a uh, Kubernetes uh, cluster. Uh, we find some funny things like here, uh, if you have eight cores and one core jobs, you can see that uh, you will have some challenges to, to pack everything together and make the best of the, the cluster. So there's, there's a lot of work going on, on on scheduling Kubernetes that covers for this as well. So yeah, if you need any more information about these topics, uh, just uh, reach out as well and I'm happy to, to discuss them. So I'll jump now to like our Kubernetes infrastructure itself and how we use traffic. And then I'll, I'll hopefully leave quite some time for questions. Uh, so this is an overview of our Kubernetes infrastructure. I mentioned that we offer it kind of uh, uh, like a public cloud is doing. We offer it uh, as cluster as a service for our users. So they can just come up uh, with their APIs, create a cluster and uh, play it around. And then of course, for the largest clusters, we are, we are a bit more attentive at making sure that they um, have things like high availability, well, well set up and um, kind of look closer to them. But they have the ability to go and, and do this. Uh, so in addition to defining like how big the nodes should be and things like this, they also can uh, enable, disable uh, a lot of different fe features. And one of them is of course the ingress controller. So I put here, like there's a lot more features that can be uh, tuned. Uh, but I, I highlight here uh, for this talk, uh, the ingress controller. So traffic out of, I don't know, 500 clusters we have, uh, uh, 390 are, are uh, using traffic today. So this is uh, something I took a couple of days ago, this screenshot. Uh, so it's uh, by default setup, uh, uh, the default the ingress controller for our setups. And um, I'll, I'll briefly mention a couple of things we did to, to ensure that integration works quite well. So I mentioned to create a cluster, we have this OpenStack based uh, private cloud and uh, the tool we use to orchestrate clusters is also um, coming with OpenStack. Um, um, basically what we do is we offer these public templates uh, that are uh, keyed on the version of Kubernetes, but actually internally they have like a lot of features enabled, disabled, depending on what we want to offer to the users. These are what we give them by default and then users can can customize uh, their clusters as they want when they deploy them. So for example, here I have an example of a cluster creation where you pass the version of Kubernetes you want or the template. 
and then you say I want uh, 10 nodes of this kind of this flavor, but I actually need to enable GPU. So what this means is that in the deployment we'll have a, a component that will make sure that the GPUs are well configured and uh, exposed to 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 the containers that request them, and also that all the monitoring is is uh, including GPUs as well. And then we also have the ability to partition the clusters. So it's very common that you don't want your, all your nodes to be the same. You might want some nodes with CPUs only another with GPUs, or you might want to split the node across availability zones, the cluster across availability zones. So this is also something that we support with these node groups. And the stack looks like this. So we, our base image is uh, Fedora Core. We used to use Fedora Atomic, but then with the Core OS acquisition, it's kind of a merge. So we are now using Fedora Core. And the, this immutable operating system was something that users were kind of um, um, not too happy at the start, but actually they, they got used to never logging into the nodes and doing a pure um, Kubernetes-based interaction with the cluster. And then the runtime, we are using ContainerD with RunC, and uh, we are using the CRI uh, interface. So we have CRI ContainerD. Uh, we do uh, Kubernetes is our main container orchestration. The reason I mentioned this here is that at the start, we actually supported as well uh, Swarm and uh, DCOS Mesos. So we deprecated support for Mesos. Uh, we still have a couple of Swarm clusters, mostly when people just want the Docker API and that's it. But Kubernetes is uh, like, I don't know, 99 or 95 percent of the clusters today. Uh, we use FluentD for log collection and aggregation and Prometheus for monitoring and metrics. Uh, the way we do this is we have um, um, the, the logs and metrics being collected inside the cluster with a, um, but lasting like two weeks uh, with a, a high granularity. But also we also give the option to publish to a central system uh, for uh, long-term storage of the metrics uh, and the logs. And here we kind of do some kind of, uh, we often do aggregation. Uh, and the reason we need this central collection is that uh, the way people have been doing is migrating their services uh, to, to Kubernetes uh, one by one. And often they need to do correlations uh, between metrics in different services. So having something that is not self-contained in the cluster um, but also uh, outside it kind of eases this task. So for traffic, this has been our default ingress controller from day one. Um, the reason we, we chose it is because when we are starting to use Kubernetes and we did it quite early, um, it was the one that uh, was most dedicated to integrating with this cloud native uh, tooling. Uh, had a healthy community. We met uh, people at a couple of conferences. Uh, the interactions were very good. And also uh, our initial use cases, it covered all of them. Um, so I'll, I'll give a couple of the use cases that we use. Uh, the most simple one is, actually we'll show this one first. So the, the simplest uh, use case is this uh, simple HTTP or HTTPS. So in this case, I, I would say like 90% of this, of our services, this is enough. Um, so that's all you need, Not, no, no need for a lot of annotations. It starts, um, the only annotation is to expose it uh, with HTTPS, um, but actually uh, this made it, uh, made kind of the point of using something like Kubernetes also for ingress, because it was so simple to define and all the magic was, was hidden. Uh, the reason all the magic is hidden is because we have this uh, kind of uh, extra integration. So one thing that um, is um, common is that you, you just want to have uh, some kind of DNS uh, based uh, uh, selection on the ingress, uh, which means that this that has to be some kind of DNS integration. So we have internally this network database that we call LandDB. Um, so what happened is uh, the, the way we do this is we deploy traffic as a daemon set um, and then but but uh, with replicas only on nodes that have this role ingress uh, so we need to select a couple of nodes that run ingress of course if we would do this just statically and this is the blue dots i have here the blue circles uh, if we would do this just statically this wouldn't work because if, if nodes crash then we would lose the ingress controllers so what we have is a small component that runs on every cluster 
that basically is watching changes in the in the um, uh, via the Kubernetes Kubernetes API, and what it's doing is watching the nodes in the status. So if it sees that uh, some nodes are unavailable or crashed or whatever, it will move to this role ingress to other nodes to make sure that two or three nodes in the cluster are always serving ingress traffic. And when it does this, it, what it also has to do is make sure that our DNS database is updated so that the ingress definitions are are um, are propagated. So if uh, we have a bunch of ingresses that need a specific al al alias, DNS alias, then we just update the network DB so that those aliases uh, point to the current uh, node serving ingress. Uh, this is uh, not ideally the ideal, of course, but the, the main reason for this is that uh, we have a flat network, provider network at CERN across the data center. So we don't have this capability of doing a software defined network yet, um, which means that we can't virtualize the networking very well. Um, so we kind of have this, uh, this uh, setup here. What this means also is that there can be some, some hiccups when DNS is being updated because of caches and, and time to propagate the DNS updates. Uh, so it's not ideal. We are working on, on improving this, but it's pretty easy. Like it kind of shows the point of, of doing this, uh, um, having this uh, way of uh, defining the, all the pieces of your cluster uh, via these resources, then you can very easily integrate with things like this, same as you do with operators and other Kubernetes components. So then the other very, very popular option is uh, to auto-generate these SSL certificates. This was also uh, like a huge uh, change for us. Um, um, it's very popular. Now the issue we have today is, um, is that DNS challenge, the, using the DNS challenge of ACME is not an option today. Uh, we don't have an API to update the uh, TXT rec records in our DNS. So we rely on the HTTP challenge, uh, which means that we, need to open the firewall to get a certificate and to renew it. And this is fine, but it kind of limits the, the usage we have for, for ACME and let's encrypt internally. And it also means that uh, um, we have kind of a chicken and egg of like, the security team will want a certificate before opening a firewall, but we need a firewall opening to get a certificate. So it's kind of has to be negotiated. Uh, but this works extremely well. We are working on the integration of DNS as well, uh, which will make things much easier. And then one use case that is also quite common, and this is mostly because of uh, this uh, grid services that we have. We, we, across the grid, we use X509 certificates for a lot of things, uh, which means that we have to push um, the certificate all the way to, to the, to the application so that they can validate uh, uh, the users. So we do this with annotations uh, with traffic uh, where we do SSL termination, uh, uh, but then we, we push the, um, the client certificate uh, along with the HTTP payload. And this, this also works quite well. Um, there's a couple of other requirements that we have. And this is the reason why we support other ingress controllers as well. So we need to do, in some cases, expose directly the TCP ports. Um, and we also need to, to do SSL pass through in some cases. Uh, so this, so this work uh, functionality that was not supported at traffic when we started uh, looking at it, um, it might be something that recently was added, but uh, I actually had a look quickly and I'm not completely sure it's, it's there already. And then one kind of dubious use case we have is to do a redirection based on headers. Uh, we have, I, I see dubious, it's, it's a real use case, but we have only one user that is requesting this. So it's not something we've put a, a lot of effort in because they, they managed to find a solution uh, for themselves. Uh, so they're pretty smart, they found a workaround. Um, so we don't, we don't put a lot of effort on that. So I come to the end, uh, hopefully leaving some time for questions. Um, so basically what I would say is the traffic has been really stable in our deployments. We basically had no, no problems. We are still using 1X versions. We didn't transition to 2.0 yet, but uh, 2X, um, but we, we plan to do it soon. Um, again, it's the most used ingress controller we have. Um, almost 400 clusters are relying on it. Um, 
if I look to the next steps, I would say that the main one is to do the integration of ingress with the, this external load balancer. So now we have an ability to have an external load balancer with the virtual IP assigned to it, which means we can stop having this need to do the update of DNS and just uh, rely on uh, a virtual IP and just manage the members there. So that's, that's a very, uh, something we are working right now. And the other one is that all this work that is being done on the new service APIs in Kubernetes. So this is something that uh, we are pretty excited about. I think this is uh, this will be very helpful, um, especially in cases where the number of use cases is quite broad and you end up relying on too many annotations. It would be nice to, to kind of uh, have the next generation service APIs uh, being a bit more, uh, allowing all these use cases without having to to fall back to these annotations. So that's all I have. I put a link here in case you're interested. We actually run some webinars sometimes as well. So we cover all the topics, including like ingress and load balancing as well. And I'm more than happy to answer all your questions. You have my email as well at the start. So hope, uh, hope this was uh, on topic. Um, hey, great job. Could we put that link in the chat? And then we have several questions to go through. If you're ready to take them, we'll get started. Um, yeah, you mean this link? Or? Yes, please. Yeah. Cool. Okay. <clears throat> Pardon. Um, so thank you, everyone, for all of your questions. We had some great ones, and I'll, I'll get started uh, now. Um, there's your link to yeah. you, Abhishek. Thank you so much. So the first question we have is, what is your Kubernetes upgrade strategy and do you have a dev and staging area as well? Also, he asks, uh, don't you use Grafana for viewing? Yeah. Um, so the, regarding the upgrade strategy, um, the recommendation we give to all our users today is as much as possible to, uh, to because we have this new service that does load balancing, to expose their services via load balancer um, as well. And this can be with ingress. Uh, and then um, when they want to upgrade, actually deploy new clusters. And we have uh, some tooling to migrate the work, uh, to kind of migrate the, the nodes, the size of the cluster gradually from one cluster to the other. And the reason we do this is that we had some some issues with upgrades in the past. Um, we like for our critical services, we run multi-master uh, with high availability with the load balancer on top. But we've seen uh, uh, cases where the upgrades didn't work quite well. So our main recommendation is to do that: to have some kind of uh, load balancer on top and migrate from one cluster to the other. This is also quite popular for people that are migrating from virtual machines to Kubernetes. Uh, they will have a load balancer where members will be uh, backed by virtual machines and then they add their cluster and they slowly migrate the workloads from virtual machines to Kubernetes by killing the VMs and, and increasing the size of the cluster. Uh, we have support for in-place upgrades, but they only take care of um, uh, upgrading components, they don't uh, do re reconfigurations today. Right on. And the uh, Grafana question, so we have Prometheus and we do Grafana on top, yeah. I should okay, that. cool, and, and actually, um, Michael had asked, what are you using for Prometheus aggregation? Is that uh, Thanos or Cortex? So, um, the way we are doing, uh, we are not doing like federated Prometheus. Uh, we have a centralized monitoring infrastructure where they run their own Prometheus instance and they configure each cluster as a Prometheus uh, endpoint. And there's a set of metrics that are being collected and aggregated. So it's kind of a in-house uh, solution, I would say. In-house solution, right on. Okay, um, and do you have any CI CD tools? Yes, so we um, we push uh, everyone to use um, um, like this new GitOps model. So we promote this very much internally with uh, with uh, training sessions, and we do uh, our recommendation today is to use uh, Flux uh, with Helm. So we we try to get everyone to deploy their applications with Helm, and to uh, automate this with uh, Flux. And we use uh, 
uh, SOPs for, for handling secrets as well in the configurations. Uh, so basically we are doing flux and some people are doing like uh, releases in single branch, some people are doing multi-branch uh, to, to manage the different uh, um, deployments. Uh, there's a couple of people using Argo CD as well. Uh, and there's some effort to kind of merge a lot of the functionality into a single library. So that's something we are very interested in as well. Cool. And uh, how do you push the locally hosted cluster logs to a centralized infrastructure? Yeah, so we do Fluent D uh, in the cluster, and then we have uh, an HTTP endpoint or several in our in our cloud in our infrastructure that basically all the services can push the logs uh, via this HTTP gateway. Uh, so basically, this is what we're doing: Fluent D HTTP, but then the backend is actually Elasticsearch. So we could eventually just bypass this HTTP gateway. The reason we do this is because we store in Elasticsearch, but we also store in um, HDFS for long-term uh, log analysis. So it kind of gives us the option, gives us the option to push in one place and then propagate to multiple backends. Cool, thank you. Um, and how do you set up HTTPS ingress using Cert Manager and Traffic CRD? Uh, so we are, we're, some people are using Cert Manager, so but we are using Acme directly. So we basically, maybe I should I should have shown an example here, but um, we just configured the Acme Acme in the um, in the ingress traffic um, daemon set, uh, and then yeah, we leave we leave traffic to do it. We are not doing Cert Manager now. in by default. Some people are. Yeah, I'm not okay. sure that answers the question. Um, and then the baby wants to answer too. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, have you considered something like Metal LB for your ing ingress controllers? Um, no. So for the load balancer, we are relying on this external load balancer, which is also part of uh, our OpenStack deployment. Uh, so it integrates very well. The reason is because we use uh, uh, OpenStack to manage these clusters as well. We can also do, um, we have all the tokens that we require to talk to the rest of the services in the data center. So we don't need to add any kind of uh, additional token to, sp to talk to specific services. We, we just need one token. Uh, so it kind of makes our life quite easy to, to have this uh, single uh, authentication authorization mechanism. Very cool. Uh, how do you manage CERN? How do you manage at CERN the different networks isolations between your projects and the fact for traffic to access your projects across the clusters and VMs? Right, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, again, the answer is we have a flat network, um, and uh, for most of our data center, it's a flat network. Um, so basically, we we can route across. Um, and the other part is that uh, I guess because CERN was very early in the internet, we have a very large amount of public IPs. So it's, it's pretty easy for us in, in this respect to, to just uh, rely on a flat network and pretty much everything will get a, a potentially publicly routable uh, uh, IP. For some, some uh, like critical systems, we have uh, like a technical network that is isolated from all the rest. But in fact, with the, in addition to this load balancing service that I mentioned that we introduced recently, we are also adding the possibility to defining uh, private networks. And uh, we have a software that define networking layer in part of the data center now. Okay, thank you, Pierre. Um, are your nodes with the ingress role doing only ingress? And how big are your nodes? Um, and then are they just, just network optimized to forward traffic along? Uh, so they are not uh, dedicated to ingress um, by default. So usually they will be randomly selected. The size of the nodes is really dependent on the, on the workload. So we have people doing, I don't know, uh, the, uh, the internal map service or uh, our pension fund or 
and then we also have like physics services that handle a lot of data. So it, it really depends. Uh, the main point here is that we use uh, Ingress mostly for services, uh, for any kind of data intensive uh, workloads. And because we have to, to read a lot of data, we actually have those containers um, skipping the, the network namespace and just using the, the host network. Um, and we basically skip all, all the all the network isolation in those cases where we really need the bandwidth uh, for the data. Cool, very cool. Thank you. Um, who manages the DNS? Uh, our network team. So we have this network database and then the DNS is uh, populated from this network database. So we kind of have an API to interact with this database. Uh, but it's um, it's not like each project can have their own um, like subdomain or anything. We have one DNS, so that's why we don't have this flexibility. For example, to to like decide which records we can edit and things like this. But uh, like the use cases are real. To to and in this case, we are working with them to to ex extend the API to allow uh, editing these TXT records as well. Uh, but yeah, it's a separate team from, from ours. Cool. Uh, let's see. Did, did you have a use case for stateful workloads running in Kubernetes like any database with headless service and TCP-based ingress? Also, how does traffic support these services? Right. So we have a couple of uses uh, of users uh, that require access to databases. And in that, that case, uh, it, it can be like, in some cases, it's more traditional uh, databases, but in we also have this uh, um, I, I don't know key value store distributed databases that still need uh, uh, persistency. In this case, uh, there are two options. Um, in some cases, they run the front ends for the databases in the Kubernetes cluster, and then they rely on a, a central uh, storage system uh, to store the data for each of the replicas. And in this case, pretty much the service endpoint is, is uh, stateless. So in those cases, you can still run a database. Of course, the performance won't be ideal. For the other cases where you need to, to run uh, multiple instances and store the data in the, in the cluster, and you need TCP access, uh, we are using, uh, in those cases, we support Nginx. And at the time, it was a, a solution that worked for our users. So we are exposing TCP uh, ports using uh, Nginx in those cases. Very cool. And then uh, just a, a couple more and then we're on perfect time. Um, how do you manage and segregate the cluster and related resources like Ingress in the thousands? And is it divided among a group of people? Uh, so is it like multi-tenancy, cl multi-tenant clusters, something like that? Let's let's say yeah. Uh, okay, so we we traditionally we do multi-tenancy by having multiple clusters, um, and recently we started having large enough clusters and use cases that uh, justify uh, this kind of um, like multi-tenant clusters in-house. Um, but this is quite recent, and we've been exploring um, things like uh, resource quotas. Um, uh, to to be able to 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 kind of partition the the cluster resources between multiple tenants. If the question was more like uh, splitting traffic across large clusters, uh, we have I talk a bit about optimizations we've done for the scheduler and the Kubernetes API to support a large amount of pods being created and deleted. And also when we split across availability zones, we also uh, take this into account when uh, defining the ingress node so that we split the, the load also across uh, availability zones. Okay, beautiful. Um, and uh, what are the strategies followed on this deployment to limit the max header size and buffer size? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure actually. I don't think we, we've uh, hit too, many, too much of those issues. I, I, I can go back and check if we actually have any, any tuning for that. Not that I can remember right now. Cool. And then we have one last question, which is uh, what is the database in use? 
uh, for Kubernetes clusters or for the services? So for Kubernetes, we are just using etcd for, for the backend uh, of, the, of Kubernetes. And then for databases, you can name it. Like it's a big place. We have a lot of projects, multiple teams, and uh, you can find MySQL, Postgres. Uh, some people use MongoDB, Cassandra. Yeah, you name it, you'll find it. We have everything. Well, beautiful. Um, well done. And and as suspected, the questions had a great breadth and, and you, you did a wonderful job answering them. So thank you so much. Um, thank you to our attendees who stayed with us this whole time and for the show. Um, and thank you're welcome, Daddy. Um, and uh, Ricardo, everyone is saying thank you to you. Thank so you. we're excited. Pressing. Yeah. Um, so what happens now is I will produce this recording and email it to all of you. Um, uh, feeling the love, everyone. Thank you so much. Be well. And uh, and um, you can find Ricardo on uh, on Twitter. Uh, what's your handle again? I'm following you, but I forget I'll it. Put it here. Yeah, okay. Big. Ah, cor -por Porto. <laughs> A H C O R P O R T O. So we'll see you on Twitter. And Ricardo, um, the floor is yours if you have anything else to say. And uh, then we do a virtual fist bump. No, I think the the main the main thing is the uh, thanking. Uh, traffic for all the, the cool software. We, we are like large users, as you can see, and also thanking all the community for, from traffic for, for um, all the efforts. And uh, we look forward to continue like collaborating with everyone um, in the near future. Cool. Okay, everyone stay very well. We have a big life ahead of us and uh, Ricardo, virtual fist bump. Thank you thank so you. much. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Cheers. Bye everyone. Bye.